All right, so welcome back everybody. So uh, for this video, I'm gonna share with you guys my top 10 favorite AEG games. Now, I have done a top 10 list for a particular publisher known as Red Raven Games, and I've done it a couple of times. But besides Red Raven Games, until now, until just recently, I haven't played more than 10 games or 10 or more games from all the other publishers. So this is the second publisher that I've played more than 10 games from. So I wanna share with you my top 10 of the ones I've played. Now, you might have seen some of my how, some of my how to play videos for these games, so you might be able to deduce which ones are in it, um, but you might not necessarily be able to deduce where I rank them from one to 10 out of the ones I've done. And you also might not have seen all those either. So some of these board games, uh, you'll have to obviously check out my how to play videos for more information if you don't know what they are. Now, you might also have some games that you like from AEG games that won't, that won't be in this list. So let me know in the comments if there's a AEG game that you really like to play that wasn't in my top 10. It's possible I haven't even played it yet. So um, anyways, and next year, if my list changes, because I play more AEG games as more continue to come out as well, um, I might do this again next year. So let me show you my number 10, which is a game called Trains. Now, Trains is a deck building game with a board. It's very similar to Dominion as far as deck building is concerned, except it's got a board as well. And some of the cards that you'll be playing will let you place out cubes on the board to basically build a, basically a railroad, a, a rail, uh, railroad on a, on a track, right? Of cubes, sort of like in a straight line, you know, from uh, location to location. Now this takes place in like uh, Tokyo, so you'll be building, you know, a railroad to and fro all the different various districts of Tokyo. Or the other side is another separate uh, large city as well that you can play on. I think it's Osaka or Sawa or something like that. So anyways, that's um, my number 10. It's a fun little deck building game. It's very easy to get into, simple. Like I said, if you've played Dominion, this game is very easy to teach if you if you know how to play Dominion. So Trains, that's my number 10. Now, my number nine used to be my number 10, but as I, I got to play it again not too long ago, I played it again. And I liked it even more. And that is Cubidos. In Cubidos, it's a racing game. You have, a, you're playing a particular character and you're trying to get it to the finish line, right? But in order to get it to the fishing uh, finish line, you have to roll dice and they have to be obviously on a particular uh, spot on the dice that you roll, a particular face, if you will. And you only start with basic dice, but as you play the game, you can get more dice. You can purchase, basically purchase more different colored dice that will allow your character to perhaps move even further than normal. And that's really cool. And then there's a lot of other abilities as well that make the game interesting. And there's several different abilities for each different dice color. And you only play with one ability for each different dice color per game. So it has a lot of replayability in it as well. And it's just a lot of fun, you know? Like there's this one dice, that's one of my favorite dice in the game is this purple dice and the dinosaur that goes with the purple dice, because it's a card, um, if you roll it, you get to move your character up four spaces, I believe, which may not seem like a lot, but when you're only move, maybe ro moving one or two spaces per turn, four spaces is a lot. And as you get more and more dice, you could potentially move up, move up a lot more than that. But four, it may be a lot, but maybe that one particular face of the die is only on one of the six sides. So even though you could move up potentially a lot, you might not get to move very often as at all because you're just not rolling well, right? So it's a very fun game. I really enjoyed this game. It might be even higher on the list if it wasn't for the stupid cubes that you have to put together for the game. I hated putting together the cubes. Absolutely hated it. They just, they should have made it simpler to do it or they should have just came already in the box already assembled for you because man, it was a drag assembling it. So it'd probably be higher on my list if it wasn't for that. But that's Cubidos, my number nine. Let's move on. Okay, so my number eight is called 
Space Base. Now, this is kind of a fun little game. This is a very popular game. It might even be on, might be higher on other people's lists as well. Now, it's pretty fun. You have uh, basically 12 ships. Everyone's got 12 ships. They basically start with the same abilities, um, but their ships might look different. So that's cool. Um, but you have basically 12 of them because that's the exact number of numbers you can get when you roll two, two dice. You roll two dice, two six-sided dice, you can get number 12, right? And so when you roll the dice on your turn, you get to activate, which is really cool. You get to activate either the highest number of two dice combined, so two dice combined, which could be 12, or you could activate two dice so you could act, and if it was like two sixes, you could activate six twice, for instance. Or if it was a three and a four, you could activate your sh uh, ship three and your ship four for two abilities. Or you can just combine them for one total number, which is a higher card, which means possibly a better ability than the two separate ones. And you buy cards in this game to uh, increase your chances of getting good stuff when you roll the lower numbers and things like that. So that's really cool. Um, you can purchase uh, spaceships to, uh, to basically give you just straight victory points in the game. Um, but if you do that, then when you roll that particular number, if you roll, because it's going to be a random, sort of a random number when you buy a particular space station, it's going to be a particular number. You won't be able to access an ability for that spot anymore. So that's the downside of getting straight victory points. But there are cards you can purchase and cards that you start with that will just give you victory points when you roll that number. It's really cool. Um, and then you you have a certain amount of money you get on each turn. You may not be buying cards every single turn, but when you purchase a card, you better make sure you're going to purchase the best one you can purchase, as in like the most expensive. Because regardless of how much money you use, it goes down to zero. So that's a problem, of course. Um, so there's ways to mitigate that. You can, some of the cards you will roll for will allow you to increase your income, which is a green cube. And if you increase your income after the money goes down to zero, you can increase, you can go back up to where your income is. So let's say you spent something that costed nine money, okay? And your income was at four. Okay, well, it would go down to zero, but then it would go back up to four at the end of your turn. So now you're, you're, you have four money for your next turn to start with, possibly getting more on your next turn. And what's really cool is you actually get to do stuff on your opponent's turns as well. So when they roll the dice, there's stuff that you can do as well. Um, as, and so it's really cool. I really like that, um, that possibility that you can take basically a turn on your opponent's turn as well. That's very fascinating, very interactive. Um, that's why this one is my number eight, Space Base. Okay, cool. So, we are moving on. We are moving on. Okay, so my number seven is a game that I don't actually own, so I'm going to have to show you just a picture of it, because I don't own the game. And that is called Istanbul. Okay? So this game is kind of interesting. One of, one of the things I like about this game is the uh, placement of workers, or should I say assistance? It sort of reminds me of a worker placement game. You place out a worker and you take an action, but you place it in a particular spot. And there's a, a grid of tiles in this game, and each tile is a different action, a different ability that does something for you. Um, but placing out an assistant as you go to take that action was really cool because you're only allowed to move two spaces per turn, and that means on your first turn, there's going to be places you just can't reach because they're too far away, okay? And so each of the four corners, basically, are too far away to reach. And you might want to take all four at some point. So you're going to be moving around, uh, maybe moving two spaces or one space at a time and, and leaving an assistant at that location to take the action. Well, eventually, you're going to run out of assistance. Once you run out of assistance, you can still move around, but you just can't take actions. So what do you do then? Well, you can backtrack. So let's say, for instance, uh, before you were starting to run out, you were planning ahead, of course. Before you were starting to run out, you left an assistant on your previous turn at a, at a location that's adjacent to the one that you're at now, okay? And then on the next turn, you move again, 
and you take that action, you leave your assistant there. Well, what you can do is you can backtrack. You can actually, you'll have to leave the assistant that you left at the spot that you just, that you took, that the turn you took previously, that one has to stay. But on a previous further turn, um, you can go and pick up the assistance that you left behind. So like I can move two spaces, right? So I can backtrack to the next spot, pick up that assistant, and then move to another spot, possibly somewhere I haven't been yet. And then that same assistant that I picked up, I can leave there to take an action. So that's one way to mitigate not basically wasting a turn or say, say or skipping a turn. Because if you don't do that, you're going to either just be moving your merchant around, unable to do anything at all, or what you're going to do is you're going to get to go to the fountain. The fountain is the starting space that you start on, and you can just choose to go to the fountain no matter how far away it is, and then when you go there, the action is to just simply pick up all of the assistants, wherever they may be, and put them on the fountain with you. So that's something you can do, and by doing that, that's all you do for the turn, really. So it's almost like a wasted action at that turn. But like I said, if you can mitigate where you go, you could potentially not have to do the fountain very often. That could be helpful if you can figure out how to mitigate that and take actions in a certain way. Of course, some actions you just can't take because maybe you don't have enough money to take the action or enough goods or maybe you're maxed out on that particular good. So going there would be a waste of time, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of stuff going on. And sometimes you can't take an action at a location because maybe you don't have enough money. And if there's an opponent there, you have to pay them money. So if you don't have money to pay them, well, you can't take the action there either. So there is some, definitely some blocking possibly that could potentially happen as well. So some interactive going on for that for sure. Um, and obviously a rush for just, just to get rubies, which is the way to end a game to try to collect six rubies. And you can do that in various ways. So that's, it's just, it's just a really fun game. I really, I've really enjoyed Istanbul. And that's why it is my number seven, Istanbul. Okay, so my number six is a game that I've played recently, as in like within less than a month, really. And that is called Wormholes. This is a pick up and deliver game. It's a very simple, fun game to get into. It's very easy to teach. Um, basically, the object of the game is to try to get victory points by either okay, or, or both, I should say, by basically delivering passengers to various planets, okay? And the other way is to use your opponent's wormholes as well to get, to, uh, as well, and if you do that, your opponents get victory points too. So you want your opponents to use your wormholes to get around, and that's what's so interesting. You're going to, in order to get around space a little easier, at first it's going to take a while to get around space because you don't have very many wormholes out, because you have to actually create the wormholes first, and you have to create, you know, two, you have to create an enter and an exit location, you know, it has to be two-way, right? And so you're going to have to create one, then you're going to have to move through space, and then place another one out. And then once you've done that, you've got a nice direct line access from one location to another. Getting around a whole lot faster with all these wormholes out is going to make so it's so much easier. And you might be delivering to a particular planet. Your opponent opponents might be delivering to other planets, meaning that they've placed out wormholes at further locations, which means you most likely will want to use their wormholes to get your passenger to that planet much sooner and get victor points, obviously, that way. By delivering passengers out but your opponents will get victory points if you use their wormholes too so it's pretty interactive in that sense as well it's a pretty simple game to get into and that's why wormholes is my number six okay so the next game is my number five and it is called Scorpius Freighter. Now, at first, when I saw this game, I thought it was cool, for sure, but I didn't know much about it at all, which is unlike me, because usually I like to look up a game and learn about it before I decide to buy it or not. But it was on sale, so I figured, hey, it's an AEG game, it's on sale, I had never even heard of the game, so I was like, let's get it. Okay, so I got it. I opened up it up. I was amazed by the components. Awesome components. I love this game, uh, component-wise especially. Now, what I really like about this game in particular is you've got, it's, there's a lot of interactive, interactivity going on with other players. 
because you've got these three spaceships around one planet each. Each planet has a different types of actions that you can take. And at most on your turn, you'll have access to maybe six actions. Some of them might be the same because there's some of the planets have similar actions, the same actions on different planets, but each planet has at least one action that you can't take on the other two planets. So you're going to want to utilize and move that ship around the planets on all three planets so you can take all the different actions in the game because you're going to want to do that. But some you may not take as often as others. So that means that some of the spaceships won't fill up as fast as others either. But regardless of the case, when you make a full rotation, whether you pass it or stop at a location that's, that makes it a full rotation, you're going to have to leave one of your cubes. If you're the one that made that, if you, you're, you're the one that made, moved the spaceship to a spot where it makes a full rotation, then you lose a good and it goes to the ship. And when the ship fills up with goods, then it basically triggers the end of the game. And so then you're gonna be rushing, trying to get what you can done at the last second, so to speak. But what is interesting besides that is you will probably most likely do, you'll most likely wanna to, want to try to mess up your opponents by making them complete the rotation so they lose it good. But sometimes you may not have that as an option because maybe the only action you can take is the one that's going to cause you to lose it good. Now you use goods to get victory points in this game by either completing side deals or by completing contracts by using a particular amount of goods, different side tracks. Um, I mean, different side deals will require a few amount of, a couple of goods, maybe two goods or one good that you have to have. And then you pay, you basically lose that good to get victory points for that side deal you just completed. Contracts are very similar to that, but you have to have more goods and sometimes you may not even have the good at all because you see in this game you start with only two of the four goods so that means you're going to need to be able to get um you're going to need to be able to fill up your storage bay with more tiles because you start with tiles in this game that go into your storage bay on your player board and you can fill it up and put more storage tiles in there to give you extra abilities and extra goods because maybe you'll need more than two of a particular good you're going to for sure so you're going to need more of a particular good, but you're also going to need the other two different goods you don't have as well. And so you're going to have to purchase them as well and get them. There's, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on with this game for sure. That's just some of the things I like about this game. But Scorpius Freighter, it's a very fun game and it's got a lot of choices, a lot of fun choices. And the components are really cool too. So I suggest you uh, check it out and uh, see if it's something you guys want to play as well. So that's my number five, Scorpius Freighter. Okay, so my number four has been around probably a long time now. It's the game that I've played probably, maybe not the most, but I've had it the longest. And that is Tiny Towns. Tiny Towns is pretty fun. It's very interactive because you're trying to build a city by placing buildings in your city. But in order to build a, a building, you need to be able to follow its blueprint and place out cubes of a particular resource that are shown on the blueprint and have to place it in that particular order of the blueprint, so to speak, as well. But while you're doing that, you're only allowed to place one good of your choice per round. So if you're playing with three other people, that means you're not going to be able to choose the next good for three more turns or four more turns. So you are it's up to your opponents what resource you're going to play the next time and it may not be a resource that you need for the the blueprint you're working on which means you're going to have to start another blueprint okay well here's what's interesting you don't have that much space on your on your city you don't have much space it's a grid you don't have much space there so at some point you're going to be like oh but if i if i have to take this cube but now I have no, if I put it the one place where I can put it, I won't be able to complete the blueprint that I'm working on. So you have to be able to mitigate that. And also you have to understand that some buildings don't score you much points or any points if they're placed against another building. So you can't just, just simply build what you want. You kind of have to build what's going to provide you the most victory points because some buildings won't give you victory points if, there's, if there isn't a particular building nearby, for instance that kind of thing. So there's a lot of fun going on. 
And there's lots of different cards. So you, the game comes with a variety of different cards for each of the different buildings. So they each score differently. So you, it adds a lot of very, a lot of replayability for sure. And then the two expansions that you can get as well add even more replayability to the game as well. There's a lot of stuff going on, but it's a theme. It's theme is sort of like an animal folk esque kind of game. There's animal folk involved. That's another reason why I like it. But you don't really see that in this game that much, unless you get like the villagers expansion. Then you might start seeing that there's animal folk involved in the game. But other than that, you don't really see it too much that there's animal folk involved in the game. It's really a city building game. So anyways, that's my number four, Tiny Towns. Okay, my number three is another game I got into also very recently. And I love this game, and that's why it's my number three, and it's called The Guild of Merchant Explorers. This is a flip and write game, basically, in a sense. It's basically a more grandiose version of a flip and write game, where you flip a card, and then you get to write something down based on what the card is. Okay, that's a flip and write game. But this, instead of, instead of using a pen and writing stuff down on a board that's like paper or erasable or something like that, you're placing out cubes instead. So you might, you might reveal a card that has a mountain on it, a mountain, uh, a, a mountain hex on it. So then you place out a cube on a mountain hex. Um, it, it does require you have to place out particular areas. Like you start in the center of the board, which is where the main city is. So you have to place a cube that's nearby that. But then as you build, as you place out more cubes, you'll be able to reach further locations because then you can place out a cube that's adjacent to what you've got. Um, the three water have to be in a straight line. They have to be adjacent to each other. But then the other cards that you could potentially you could potentially flip over can kind of be mitigated on where you put them, which is really cool. Now there's a lot more stuff going on with this game than just simply that. That's the basic part of the game. Then there's goals, which you'll want to try to complete that will get you extra victory points by completing a goal. Um, there's three goals usually in a game. And... And it could be a variety of different things. Like one of the goals might be that you have to basically discover three ruins that are on the borderline of your board, meaning they're touching the end of your board, which means they're far away from you. You're going to have to, you know, and they're probably on the other side. So you're going to have to go through water just to get to them and stuff like that. So that means it's going to require you to, you know, get cubes all the way out there to do that. And it might not even be possible to even do one ruin on your first round because What's interesting is at the end of each round, all of the cubes, all of the progress you made is erased. You have to remove all of the cubes at the end of each round, which might seem bad, but there are ways to mitigate where you can go. If you can complete a region, so let's say you complete a region, and let's say the region has three hexes, and let's just say it's like three mountain hexes, and you place out, you have a cube on each one of those three mountain hexes, and there's no other mountain uh, terrain hexes adjacent to any of those three, then that's a region that you've completed. You get to take off one of the cubes immediately on an empty space and put down a, a, a town, a village. Well, then when the round ends, all of the villages that you placed out get to stay there. And then at the next round, you have access to those areas as well. So instead of simply starting in the central area, you'll be able to place out cubes next to that village that's further out. And that means you can maybe reach farther locations. Now, you'll, you'll get victory points sometimes just by simply placing out a cube. It might give you some victory points, too. Um, there's other ways of getting extra victory points just on the board alone. Um, and, then, and then, besides just simply terrain cards, or for the explore cards, just simply flipping a, a terrain card over, you might even flip over an error card. And error cards are going to be a variety of different cards that are going to be different for every player that lets you let me let you will let you place out tons of cubes, just tons of cubes, so many different cards, it's just amazing. And there's there's three error there's three different error cards, so you're going to have three different cards that are powerful, unique abilities that you're going to utilize several times during the course of the game. The first one, you could potentially use it like four times, potentially, maybe more than that. And there's four rounds in the game. So like I said, you, you're going to get to use it a, a, a lot. So it may seem at first, the first round may seem like you didn't accomplish much. But as you, as you explore, explore the world, 
it gets even more enjoyable because you'll feel like you're accomplishing more and more and more. Man, I just love this game, and that's why the, the Guild of Merchant Explorers is my number three. Okay, so my number two. My number two is Cascadia. This is a very fun game. It's a very good family game. And I've even taught this game to game to people who weren't who weren't gamers, who don't play lots of board games, or any really. Or what they think of a board game is like Monopoly. That's what they think a board game is. And they've enjoyed this game a lot. I haven't had anyone who has played this who didn't like it. It's a very fun game. In this game, you're placing out animals and you're placing out terrain tiles as well. You can get victory points by trying to build the largest forest biome or the largest mountain biome or the largest uh, river biome. You can get points for that. And you'll get points for your largest of each. And you might get m even more points if you have the largest forest at the end of the game or the largest river at the end of the game. But while you're trying to strategically place out terrain tiles that, to form each of the different biomes, you're also trying to place out animals based on each different card. You're, there are five cards in the game, one for each animal. And so you're, you're trying to place out animals according to those cards. There's a little bit of replayability because there's a few different cards for each of the different animals. But the basic cards that they teach, show you to play for your first game are what I'm going to talk about. They're just so much fun. I've, I've, I haven't even bothered playing with the other cards because... Because I just really love that five set, and and it's just so much fun. So one of the things you can do in the game is trying to place out pairs of bears. And so that means you can't place other bears next to those two bears. They have to be next to each other, adjacent to each other, because it's a mating pair of bears. It's it's thematically, it's it makes sense. And you're going to score tons of points if you can get multiple pairs of bears. It makes sense. That thematically makes sense. And it just, it's just awesome. You're going to get a lot of points that way. But just because one animal, may, one animal may seem like you're going to score the most points if you go the, that particular animal route, all of the animal routes are just as powerful as the other ones, pretty much, <clears throat> if you can manage to pull each of them off. Like the solitary hawk. I never thought the solitary hawk was that powerful, so I rarely did it. But in my last game, I won the game thanks to my solitary hawk. And what that means is... I have to place out a hawk, but they can't be uh, they can't be adjacent to any other hawk. If you do, you get zero points. But then you can only get a few points for each solitary hawk you have. But if you manage to get eight solitary hawks in different spots in your biomes, then you're going to score tons of points that way. And I was able to do that. And thanks to the hawk, I won the game. It was amazing. I had never won thanks to that before. So it just goes to show you that it doesn't matter what animal you go for. You could, you could potentially win the game regardless. Each animal is amazing. I'm not going to talk about the rest of the animals, but they're each, they're each amazing. They're each going to be something you might want to go for. And it's really contingent on what you draw from a bag anyways, because you're randomly drawing animals from a bag. So sometimes you, might ne you just might never get that salmon to show up or that bear to show up or that elk to show up or the hawk or the fox. And so you can't rely on what you're drawing from the bag. You can't, you'd be like, okay, well, I really like foxes, so I want to get as many of them as I can. I really like salmon. I want to get as many of them as I can. But if they never show up, there's a few ways to mitigate maybe getting them to show up. But you can't, you can't just simply try that. You have to go with what you're, you're getting the most of. And every game is going to be different. Some games is going to be more of a fox game. You're going to get a lot of foxes this game. Other games, maybe not so many many foxes, because it's really just lucky of which animals will show up from the bag. It really is, but it's a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun, and anybody can win this game because, you know, because <laughs> sometimes you you might be going for a particular animal, but maybe somebody else has been going for another animal, and they were able to get it every single time that it showed up, and it worked for their strategy. You know, you just never know with this game. Because like I said, every animal that in this game could potentially help you win. And don't forget, you're getting victory points by building the largest of each of the different habitats as well. So you can also focus on that too and get a lot of points that way as well. Man, it's just amazing. It's a super fun game. That's why Cascadia is my number two. Okay, so my number one, my most favorite game from AEG is Ecos the first continent. This is a very fun game. It is my most favorite game. 
mostly because I love animal games. It's, it's one of the best animal games I've ever played. It's one of my most favorites, and it's from AEG. Now, in Ecos the First Continent, the object of the game is you're trying to build a continent by placing out more terrain tiles, maybe some ocean tiles, um, placing out trees and mountains and animals. Now, you have card, you have these cards, and every player's got their own cards, so no one's, no one's going to be going the same route. Okay, you might be the player who's placing out the most deserts, but another player might be placing out the most oceans. Um, another player might be placing out the most um, gazelles, you know, or another, another player might be like, <laughs> okay, let him place out all those gazelles, and when he does, I'll place out my lion, and then I'll eat all those gazelles, and then get tons of points that way. Because you can get a lot of points based on what the cards tell you to do. Uh, some cards will give you tons of points, if you have a large flock of gazelle, a large grouping of gazelle, you know, some cards will give you tons of points based on groups of trees or just trees in general. How many trees are out or how many mountains are out or how many of uh, gr how many grass tiles are out or how many desert tiles or ocean tiles are out. It, it's just really cool. But the, what's really fun is the other mechanisms in the game of how you're going to build the continent. What you have is cubes and cards and then you have a bag full of stones that have symbols on them. The harbinger, and everyone's going to get to be a harbinger in this game, is going to randomly draw a stone from a bag, uh, from the bag. And then that's the symbol that you'll be doing for that that part of the game. And everyone will look at their cards and they'll be like, oh, do I have this symbol or not? If they don't have the symbol on their cards, then they get to rotate a dial that could potentially give them some give them something to do later on as well. So you're still going to get to do something even if you don't have the symbol from the bag that was drawn. But then everyone else who does gets to put a cube down, just one, on the symbol that was drawn. So they might, they might have five suns, but they still only get to place one cube down on one sun on, on their cards. And so you're, you'll be taking out bags simultaneously. Everyone's going to be doing this, placing cubes on their cards, the harbinger as well. Everyone's going to be doing it. It's a very simultaneous game. It rarely stops. It only stops when somebody calls out Ecos, which happens when a player is able to fill up their card with cubes, cover every symbol. They're able to cover up every symbol on their card with cubes. Then they get to do what the card tells them to do, whatever it may be. Like I said, placing out tiles, placing out trees, placing out animals. And there's there's rules for placing out such things as well. So sometimes they may not be able to do it either. So, so you have to keep, keep an eye on that. Um, but you can always ecos later. You know, if you can't ecos at that moment, you can place a cube on a different different card instead. You know, and and Miko's that later when you're able to do the card, when you're able to play it, because some things, some cards won't let you play them if there's no room to put that animal, or there's no room to put that tree. So that's that's what's really interesting. Man, it's just a lot of fun. So much interactive going on. You're going to be doing things like I said that might help your opponents out. You might be getting tons of victory points by placing out animals, but then someone else might place a lion out later. And get tons of victory points that way by eating all of your animals. <laughs> you just never know. You just never know what's going to happen. Um, and of course, it's it's whoever like gets to a certain amount of points first wins. So you might be like, hey, I'm going to eat all your animals with my lion. But then somebody might play a card and they might get a ton of victory points by, by having tons of these gazelle out. And it allows them to end the game and win it. And you're like... Oh no, I was this close to eating your eating your animals with my lion. Oh. So you can't just hold back and try to get you, you you have to you have to know when to get that lion out before that other player potentially could win the game before you do it. And man, it's just a lot of fun. There's so much going on. I love this game. That's why it's my number one. Ecos the first continent. So that's my top ten favorite AEG games. Um, if you guys liked this video, don't forget to leave me a like. Leave a comment, like I said, if there's an AEG game you like a lot. Maybe it's one of the ten that I like. Maybe it's not on my list. And like I said, there's still many AEG games out there that I would like to play that I just have not played yet. So it might be on the list someday. Who knows? So thank you guys for watching this video, and I'll see you guys again next time. Goodbye!